All right. It's nice to see a crowded room. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Frank Bousquet, Deputy Director of the IMF Institute for Capacity Development. And it's really our pleasure today to launch the Capacity Development Event Series for the 2024 Spring Meeting. So thank you, everybody, for attending. I understand that we have many colleagues that are online. It's one of the most successful events. Uh, on capacity development, and we are so happy uh, to uh, share with you the plan for the coming days. So we are going to start today with an event on energy subsidy reforms, including positive development on Central Africa Republic, and then we'll be moving immediately after on Somalia's fiscal journey to debt relief, and on our efforts on boosting domestic revenue mobilization, with example from Ghana, Paraguay, and the views of one of our largest contributors on fiscal capacity development France. So a number of events on capacity developments over the coming few days, which we hope you will really enjoy. Later this week on Thursday, we will unveil the Global Public Finance Partnership, together with some of our first contributing partners and beneficiary countries. And on Friday, we will also highlight an important aspect, which is about governance diagnostic for performance and accountability with a special focus on Mauritania. As you will see, we have, and that's extremely important, in all those events, participation from ministers. That is a testament of the strong political ownership on capacity development work, which is also critical to build sustainable growth and development. As the IMF Managing Director, Christiana Georgieva, mentioned in her curtain raiser event last week, it is essential to build capacity to navigate today's demanding environment and invest in transformation for tomorrow. I also would like to mention that all this work has been made possible thanks to the contribution of all our partners who will join many of those events. They can also share actually the credit for all the major accomplishments that we are going to try to highlight and share with all of you this week. So quick logistical note, there will be for each of these events a short Q&A and obviously, you'll have the opportunity to engage with our speakers. Just please try to signal yourself to one of our colleagues volunteering with, uh, who are wearing white uh, jackets. So our next event will follow immediately this one. So please stay put, unless you want to go somewhere else. But we encourage you to stay. Let me now invite the Minister of uh, Finance of the Central Africa Republic, Monsieur Hervé Ndoba, Camilla Olmemo, Practice Manager from the World Bank, and Delphine Pradi from the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department to join the stage for a capacity development talk entitled Energy Subsidy Reform, How to Make Them Work. Over to you, Delphine. Thank you very much, Frank, and thank you all for attending. Two trillion. Two trillion dollars. That's the IMF estimate of the cost of explicit energy subsidies that countries are currently paying for people to access cheap energy. What's the issue with that? Well, the answer is straightforward. In a nutshell, energy subsidies don't work. They don't reach their goals. Most of the time, the poor don't benefit from them as much as the rich, if they benefit at all from them. They crowd out very important spending, such as on education, health, infrastructure. And of course, they have very negative impact on the environment. But they are here. These two trillions of dollars are being spent every year by countries on energy subsidies. So they are here, they persist, because they are difficult to reform. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes strong political buy-in. So let me uh, present how the IMF helps countries uh, who choose to go on this journey, helps them reform their energy subsidies. But for, first, let me say what we are talking about. What are subsidies? Well, in theory, as you can see, there is a clear definition. Subsidies are the difference between an efficient price, a regulated price, times the consumption uh, uh, that is made in a country. 
pretty straightforward. So if you want uh, to reduce the subsidies, you increase the regulated price, and voila. That's the theory. That's the practice. In practice, things are a lot messier than that. Efficient price, very difficult to estimate. Formal consumption, very difficult to estimate. Regulated price, they don't apply to everybody. They don't apply everywhere in a country. So things differ very much from theory to practice. So that's where we come in. Consider the work that we did in Central African Republic. Back in 2023, we went there to provide support to the authorities, and we actually estimated that the regulated price was this P bar over here was actually higher than the efficient price. And it may come as a surprise to you, but one of our main recommendations was not to increase the price, but to actually decrease the price. Yes, the IMF said decrease the price. We did that. And the authorities did that in July 2023. What happened then? Formal consumption resumed. It actually increased, and the fiscal revenues went up uh, in the process. Um, but to, to do that, we had to dig deep. Uh, and we also had to uh, provide much more than just this one recommendation, because we know that one time price adjustment is not enough. We also know that, again, it takes time to reform, and we need strong and sustained political leadership to do that. So let me show you the steps that we take when we provide support to countries who, uh, who go along with these reforms. Very rapidly, and I will go into more detail with, it, uh, with each step. The first one is we adapt. All country contexts are different. So we need to take into account the specificities of the country. The second step is we dig deep. We need to open the black box of the subsidies. As I said, there is no straightforward subsidies, and all country subsidies are actually very different. And the third one is we need all hands on deck. Uh, we cannot go through this process alone. The authorities need support, so we need to build out this support. We reach out, and we also reach out to other uh, development partners with whom we, we work very closely. Step one, adapt to country context. So we've done more than 40 missions in uh, 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 all continents, and there is rising demand for this type of capacity development on energy subsidy reform. All countries vary. They have different levels of development. They have different, le different levels of energy sufficiency. Uh, they have different geographies, they, they all vary. In the case of Central African Republic here, it's a landlocked country, no access to sea, even though there is a big river, the Ubangi. It's fragile, it's conflicted, it's low capacity. So we needed to take that into account when first doing our assessment, but also then uh, drafting the recommendations and proposing the recommendations to uh, uh, the authorities. The second step is we dig deep. As I said, uh, in pa on paper, very nice equation. In fact, there is no such thing as an equation out there. So we need to build our recommendations on strong analysis and strong diagnostics. First, we need to understand what's the fiscal cost of subsidies, the fiscal liabilities attached to subsidies. We need to understand who benefits from the subsidies that are there, and we need to understand how they are financed. And then, when we decide that, uh, uh, when the authorities decide that it's time for them to phase them out, we need to, they need to do so having a clear view of the impact especially on the most vulnerable, that this phasing out will have. And that's what we do when we run the diagnosis. But then we need to translate this diagnosis into actionable measures, because that's what the authorities really need at the end of the day. They need to have measures to have a plan to, to implement with a sequence of measures to take month after month, if needed, 
within a year, within two years. Because again, these uh, take time. And then there is a need to build broad support, which leads me to my last slide. Step three, reach out. We need whole hands on deck, as I said. First, the first step is to look around. We need to look around. What are peers doing? Maybe the peer other peer countries, they are doing good things, and it's good to emulate. Maybe they are doing not such good thing, and it's good to stay away from what they are doing. So it's good to learn from peers. And in the case of Central African Republic, which is surrounded by many countries with the same currency, with energy subsidies, it's good also to see uh, what they do. The second is collaborate with other partners, with other development partners, especially with the World Bank. During all our IMF missions on energy subsidy, we reach out to the World Bank because they have the sectoral and the technical expertise, especially on two very important sectors that are really crucial to have a comprehensive reform. The first one, is social protection. How do you put out there some social mitigating measures so that the most vulnerable are not that much impacted? The second one is about the energy sector itself. How do you strengthen the energy sector so that it is diversified and subsidies don't come back? And then the third pillar is the ownership. There, there needs to be political ownership of the reform. And this is where the strong political buy-in is really important. During all our mission, we meet with all the relevant and different stakeholders, and we accompany the authorities by building their support. And that's very, very important. So as a conclusion, uh, let me go back to this, uh, 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 first, um, to the, to this first sentence, which is, there is no one-size-fits-all reform for energy subsidy. All country contexts are very different, but each time when we provide support on this very sensitive topic, we adapt, we dig deep, and we reach out. And let me do just that, and reaching out to our colleague from the World Bank, Camilla Olmemo, to whom I give the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Delphine. Um, honorable Minister, good afternoon. Uh, I am the manager from the World Bank on Social Protection and Jobs, and I will talk a bit more about one of the points Delphine made, which is how do we protect the poor and vulnerable uh, in the process of implementing uh, subsidy reform. Um, fuel subsidies do not benefit the poorest, as we've heard from the IMF as well, and the data for the Central African Republic shows that as well. Uh, subsidies are regressive, they benefit the richer families more than they benefit the poorest. Um, and if you look at a global level, uh, about half of the spending on energy subsidies in low and middle income countries benefit the richest 20% of the population, simply because they consume more energy. Um, yet, when the subsidies are removed, we see that the direct and the indirect impact on the poorest can be very large, uh, um, pushing the vulnerable into poverty or pushing the poor deeper into poverty because of inflation. Um, what we're also seeing is that these immediate impacts can create a lot of resistance to reforms that can actually be very beneficial in the longer term. Um, so what have we learned on what we can do and what uh, the governments can do to make sure that mitigation measures are a very central part of an energy subsidy reform agenda? Uh, there are three things, um, and they're not complicated. The first is you need to have the right reform package. The second is you need to sequence the reforms correctly. And the third is that, as Delphine said as well, the stakeholder con uh, consultations and the communication strategy becomes very, very important. Um, for the right reform package, to really respond to this, it's important for governments to have in place programs that target the poor and vulnerable through a social protection system. Um, these interventions are absolutely critical to make sure that when the energy subsidy is removed, when prices go up, 
uh, the poor and vulnerable are receiving additional support um, to mitigate this impact. Um, to be able to do that, there needs to be programs in place that are big enough in coverage, um, that are able to expand very quickly, and to also shrink again uh, very quickly when that's needed, um, and that can deliver benefits, mostly in cash, in a very transparent, direct, and efficient manner. That also means that you need to have the sequencing right. So governments who are thinking of reforming subsidies, which we've heard from IMF, they all should do, need to invest in their social protection systems up front. You need to have in place a registry of poor and vulnerable households. You need to have good um, uh, delivery systems when it comes to payments in place. Uh, you need to know who to pay, how, and when. Um, and also, I really would like to highlight before we hear from the minister, uh, the important importance of the communication and stakeholder engagement. Um, because really this is important because there will be resistance to reform because people are going to have to pay more for something that you know several people in the population spend a lot of um, energy and a lot of fuel. Um, so to have a very clear communication of why are we doing this, what is this going to mean in terms of extra money coming in to our wallets, and what are we going to spend that money on? Are we going to spend more on social sectors, invest in more sustainable transport solution, invest in more renewable energy? So that communication becomes very, very important and should happen before the subsidy is removed. Um, um, so what is great to see in the Central African Republic is that from a social protection perspective, they are laying a very strong foundation. Investing in social protection programs, investing in the social registry, investing in digital payment system. All of this is going to mean that you will be able, um, if you're able to overcome some of the other challenges, you're gonna be able to, um, to implement the reform with the right sequencing, the right, re the right reform package. Um, and we have many global experiences to learn from. Indonesia, Morocco, Egypt, uh, just to mention a few. Um, and with the IMF, we, of course, stand ready to support uh, the government of the Central African Republic. So with that, um, I am very honored to hear from um, the Honorable Minister, uh, Mr. Erva uh, Ndoba, uh, to tell us more about the plans for the Central African Republic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, for giving me the floor and my warm welcome to my warm uh, thanks to IMF and World Bank Group uh, to give to Central African Republic this huge opportunity to share our experience on this major uh, subject, uh, energy subsidies reforms, how to make them work. Um, and may maybe to give the assistance um, uh, some uh, perspective on how major the subject is for Central African Republic, I will add some metrics to the big picture uh, shown by uh, Delphine on Central African Republic. So some metrics on uh, economic, social, and uh, development challenges metrics. High inflation, uh, around 5.6%. Tax to GDP, we're talking about 8% in Central African Republic when all the countries around are around 17%. GDP growth, 0.8% in 2023, and we're expecting 1.5% in 2024. Expecting years of school, 8. UN capital index, 0.4. Life expectancy, 54 years old, about uh, the energy infrastructure, 90% uh, of the population in Central African Republic don't have access to electricity. And regarding the connectivity infrastructure, 1,500 paved roads, consider that the country is as big as 623,000 square kilometers. So you can have this view of the big challenges. And as a Minister of Finance, I think that 
my big responsibility is to find money to increase our capacity of mobilization of domestic revenue in order to finance the development needs. Uh, but maybe some people in the room can think that uh, this subject should be a subject of the Minister of Energy. Why does a Minister of Finance is uh, just here on stage? Uh, it's just because, you know, uh, in this situation, you can imagine that every subject which is linked to the mobilization of domestic revenues cares the Minister of Finance. And regarding the fuel sector, the trade of, this, uh, of the fuel in our country represents 25% of our domestic revenues. Or should I say it represented? Because this was the situation in 2022 before uh, the crisis that we've all known regarding you know, the shortages of, uh, uh, of, of fuel uh, in our countries and the high prices that we faced uh, worldwide. So uh, at this point, if we are talking about 25% uh, back to 10% now, because this is now what we have in our domestic revenue, it just represents 10%. Uh, so uh, of course, you have to deal with the money man. So we uh, called IMF. Uh, the technical team uh, to help us in order to dig deep and to see how we can manage this uh, situation. Uh, so we were into this situation where we were dealing with affordability and with the tax revenues. How can we fix the limits? How can we still collect money on these sectors while we have to care about the poor populations in our country. And we have to, uh, uh, to, to help the private sectors to develop, because energy, of course, is, uh, is key to, 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 to do that. So um, we, we had two um, uh, conditions. The first one is the price of importation, on which we can't do nothing. You, you, you've seen the, the map. Um, we are landlocked countries, and uh, with uh, on the infrastructure uh, connectivity side, we just had have one way to access to the sea through uh, Cameroon. For some of uh, of you who knows the Central African Republic configura configuration, um, and the second one it is the tax revenues. So we had to deal with those two conditions. The first one, of course nothing to do. So we had to see, to look at the second one, and to uh, have a good understanding of all the stakeholders uh, which are around this uh, uh, tax revenues uh, in order to try to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to find the best way to, 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 to move forward. So we asked to, uh, to, to Delphine to, uh, and the team to come in Bangui. So they were uh, in February 2023. Uh, in Bangui for the first time. Uh, but just to let you know that uh, they didn't come only once. They came also in, uh, in, um, in, in last February. Uh, but uh, don't, don't tell anyone. If there's any delegation of any countries here in the room, please keep this information secret. Because it was, it was, a, it was a challenge to have them, because they are, uh, the demands on this, uh, on, on this team is very, is very hard. But it was really helpful. It uh, helped us to explain the situation to all the stakeholders on the government side, uh, and we decided to move forward. I agreed. The Minister of Energy, my colleague, agreed. The Prime Minister agreed. And the President agreed. This political support is key even to dig deeper, deeper because if you don't have this political support at this high level, you'll never been able even to go deep inside uh, the, the, the informations of what is going on in the country and how can we build together um, a, a, a solution. Um, 
Another thing is, the, so th th this was the first point. So we, we are dealing be between affordability on one, on one hand and tax revenue on the other hand. The second point I want to make is the coordination, which is key. Um, because we have to avoid competition between uh, stakeholders inside the government. Because, of course, you have the interest of the Minister of Energy, which is the minister of this sector, who can take some decision in order to strengthen the, the sectors in, in his mind. And you also have, on the, on the other end, the Minister of Finance, who is looking at, as I told you at the beginning, who, who is looking at how to make money in order to, strength, to strengthen the fiscal capacity of the country. Uh, so this coordination is very important. So this is something uh, which should not be neglected. Uh, you have to, uh, to, to, to build conversations based on data. This is, this is key. Because when we just speak, um, you, you, you don't have uh, the, the metrics which are necessary to show off, uh, to prove that you should go this way or that way in order to generate uh, um, more, more revenue. So this is what we did uh, with, the, with, with the team. Um, we collect all the data all the necessary data into the country, uh, and we then put them on the table and engage very strong discussion with the other uh, st st stakeholders. But there's not only the, the other ministers, the sectorial minister, the minister of energy, uh, who is involved in this. We also have the other stakeholders, you know, uh, those who import the fuel, those who market, who sell the fuel in the countries, and you also have uh, the consumers also of, uh, of, this, um, of this fuel. So this is very important and uh, we are very happy uh, to announce that we, uh, we, we, we've landed uh, with, uh, with an action plan, a very powerful action plan. And I should say that it was the second generation of the action plan because when the team came in February 2023, um, they produced a first action plan. Okay, and we go back into this action plan and we, and we had a lot of discussion and then uh, we have now uh, landed, as I said, with a second generation of the, of the action plan, which is very strong and on which we are really engaged. And I would like to thank uh, a, a lot the FADs uh, because this was uh, this is very uh, important. The third point I want to make is the support for a long term uh, to develop the sector of energy. As you can see, uh, and you know that uh, energy is key if we want to engage uh, deeply the development of our countries. So, of course, we are dealing with a uh, current situation. Now we have the way and we have the different actions that are, the, the, that are on, on, on place and we are working on, uh, on them. Uh, but we, we should also think uh, the, the, the future. The, the, the next future. Uh, we have those situation of, uh, of green energy also. I think that it's not because we are a poor country and uh, we have um, a lack of capacity of, uh, of this question that we should just wait uh, to, to develop. We should see the, 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 the glass empty, um, empty full for me. And we can make a very uh, strong leapfrog uh, to, 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 to think about the next, uh, the next step. So uh, once again, I will, I will ask uh, for the team to, to help us to continue the, 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 um, uh, the reflection and uh, you know, to, uh, to think about this, uh, this subject because there's a lot of things. You know that in Central African Republic, we have um, uh, uh, experienced two, uh, solar, um, uh, two solar plants. Uh, in Central African Republic with a capacity, total capacity of like 40 uh, megawatts. But, you know, energy is key. So I will just stop here and I will be very happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much. All right. Many, many thanks, uh, dear minister. Uh, we are running out of time. So we are going to actually to need to move to the other event focusing on Somalia. But I really would like to thank the Minister for showing the importance of leadership in the sensitive agenda.
and also recognize the partnership of, between the two sister organizations, really focusing on the social protection, the expertise on the World Bank, and focusing on all the fiscal affairs department expertise with the IMF. So really a good example of cooperation at the country level, supporting the minister, showing all the leadership needed on a very difficult agenda. So thank you very much. We will start the other event on Somalia in two minutes. Thank you.